My name is Bonnie Grimm. My father, bless him, is a kind man who, throughout my whole childhood, worked his widowed fingers to the bone as a miller to provide for me. By the time I had grown up and he was beginning to show signs of old age, he, knowing he could no longer provide for the both of us, wished to find me a husband. He used to say, If any good suitor comes and asks for her, I will give her to him. He said that often enough and in enough variety of company that it was not long before a suitor did come. This one, the first to knock on our door, appeared to be very rich. So my father, seeing no fault in him, promised me to him. I, however, did not like him in the way a girl should like the man to whom she is engaged. I saw something in that first impression. The setting of his lips in a sort of snark, a curled mockery. They gave me no confidence in him. Whenever I saw or thought of him, I felt a secret horror. He would enter my dreams at night, and I would find myself fleeing from what felt like an oppressive nocturnal pursuit. In my waking hours, thoughts of him would cause the skin on the back of my neck to tighten and a pit to form in my belly. I did not, of course, know at the time why I was so utterly repulsed by him. On occasion, I caught sight of him, and once, bumping into me in the market, he said, You are my betrothed, and yet you have never once paid me a visit. His speech was Slippery, insincere somehow, even for so few words. He caught me by surprise, and since I had no time to think of a good excuse, I mumbled something about not knowing where he lived. He looked at me, smiling awkwardly, and said, My house is out there in the dark forest. I pointed the way to your father on the day we met. I tried to excuse myself, saying I could not find the way there. He told me that next Sunday I must come out there to see him. That he had already invited others and would strew ashes for me to mark a path through the forest. When Sunday came, I woke, dressed, and filled my pockets with peas and lentils for what I hoped would not be a long journey. The sky was bright and large and blue as I set out. But as I began making my way to my betrothed's house, the sky curdled somehow, tightening and lowering. My imagination, perhaps. Even the leaves seemed to be turning gray. I followed the ashes that were scattered at the entrance of the forest, digging into my pockets with every few steps and throwing a couple of peas and lentils on the ground. That is, I didn't even trust the path, so I marked it in my own way. It took me many hours of walking until I reached what appeared to be the middle of a forest, where it was the darkest. As I was about to lose hope of ever reaching my destination, I found it. A solitary house, dark and dismal-looking. Not the house of a wealthy man, but of a pauper, a land squatter. Certainly this could not be it, but at least it was something, and maybe the person inside could point me the way. With these thoughts in my mind, I walked to the door and knocked. No response. I stepped inside, but no one was within. I stood still in the middle of what appeared to be, because of the presence of so many knives, the kitchen listening for any signs of life. Absolute stillness reigned. Suddenly, I heard a voice cry, Turn back! Turn back, young maiden dear! Tis a murderer's house you enter here. Startled not only by the words, but also by the screeching that produced them, I jumped and looked for the source of that voice. No one. Then a creaking sound like a metal swing, drew my eyes upward to a cage hanging on the wall. 
Within it was a beautiful bird, something I had only ever seen in books, dark gray with a distinctive scarlet red head and a wispy crest of the same color. It had a nut in its mouth, tossing it in the air to speak and then catching it again. Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear. Tis a murderer's house you enter here. Again came the urgent admonition before the beak clamped shut once more. Not believing my senses, I passed beneath the cage to the next room, and then to the next, and through the whole house, which was larger on the inside than I had earlier discerned. The place, the large interior spaces, all of it was entirely empty. At last, I came to a doorway that led down to a dank cellar, smelling of mildewed earth and cigarette smoke. A scraping below caused me to carefully descend through an almost complete darkness the rickety stairs to the bottom. Gradually, I realized I was hearing a bubbling sound as I came to a wall. I made a left turn into a cavernous underground and perceived a faint light some many steps before me, glowing embers outlining the base of a squat, bulbous cooking pot, illuminated part of a cellar. It seemed to be an entryway into that larger system of caves. I approached the dim light and noticed, crouching before the pot, an old woman. Her head shook and bobbed constantly. Assuming her to be my betrothed's mother or relative, I asked, Can you not tell me if my betrothed lives here? The old woman, whose face I could barely make out in the weak light, looked up at me and said, Oh, my poor child, where is it you think you've come to? She paused, expecting me to answer, but I could not. My eyes, adjusting to the dimness of their surroundings, saw that her face was long and sorrowful. Her eyelids, I gasped when I saw them, had been sewn shut with black thread like stitched wounds. She went on. I shall tell you, then, you are my sweetest in a murderer's den. Let me guess. You think he will soon marry you, yes? I nodded, though she could not see me, and said, Yes. The old woman grinned toothlessly and said with pity, Poor thing. You will soon be dead. Look. And she pointed to that great big pot near which she was sitting. Nay what she was tending, bubbling over the lit embers. They have left me here to tend to it, to make sure it continually boils for when they return. And I have been here a very, very long time, feeding on whatever it is they boil, and I am always still hungry. And she smiled at me again. Poor dear, Poor, sweet dear. Not yet their venison. I stepped back, a gasp escaping from my throat. But why? I whispered, my voice failing. She continued with her narrative as though she anticipated my question. When they have you in their power, and after they have cut you to pieces without mercy, they will cook you in eat you, and feed some of you to me. You see, sweet child, they are eaters of man flesh by desire, but I am only so by compulsion. It's that or nothing. Several moments passed in which neither of us said anything. The old woman appeared to be thinking. You're different from the other girls, she said, finally. You weren't dragged, but 
came down here on your own. That means you can leave on your own. And you know the way back to the village, yes? Suddenly there was a knocking and a shuffling sound on the floorboards above me. If I do not have compassion for you, the old woman said, you will share the fate of those other girls and I will die here. Maybe I have already died. Will you trust me? I really didn't see that I had another option. The master of this house had returned, and he was with company. And they were dragging something that was struggling against them. So the old woman quickly led me with a strong, almost entirely bony grip by my wrist behind three large wooden casks stacked against the cavern wall where I could not be seen. She turned her mouth toward me, and with awful breath, her face was close enough to kiss, whispered, Be still as a mouse. Do not make a sound or move, or all will be over for you. At night, when the eaters of man flesh are asleep, we will escape. I have long waited for an opportunity. She then scampered quietly back to her post, finding it again, it seemed, by moving toward the heat, turning her head this way and that to adjust for her movements until she was again squarely seated where I had found her. Hardly was this done, then did the godless crew descend the stairs, pulling and pushing something with them. Peeking through the casks, I could see them in the light of the embers, which the old witch was fanning into greater flame, causing the bubbling pot to smoke. Three men stood over her. One of them, my betrothed. They had dragged and pushed a young girl down the stairs. The three men then laid the poor girl on the ground. My betrothed hacked the young woman's beautiful body into pieces, while the others gathered them up for marinating in her own blood within a long metal basin. Had I not fainted at that moment, I would have tried to flee. So great was the impulse within me to get away from that scene. And surely I would have been quickly apprehended. When I awoke, I found that my body was still paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move at all laying back against the cave wall, conscious of a greater light in the room from the kindling that had been thrown onto the fire as the girl's flesh was dropped into it to boil into stew. I smelled the broth from where I was, and I thought I was dreaming, at home, in my own bed, having a nightmare. Their conversation must have been what awakened me, they were talking about mundane things, chewing and sucking comfortably on a few raw bones they'd kept to the side. I knew if I were to make a sound, my fate would be the same as hers. I put my hand on the ground to steady myself and felt something small, thin and warm, like a worm or a small snake squish beneath the heel of my palm. I yanked back my hand, steadying myself to gauge whether I had made a sound. No sound, no alert. The men continued as before. I put my hand back down and picked it up. I couldn't see it in the darkness, but I knew what it was as I pulled a piece of metal from it. Before I had passed out, well, the men were still disarticulating the girl. One man, a dwarf, had blurted out the finding of a prize. A gold ring. Fancy. And when he couldn't pull it off, he brought an axe heavily down upon it, and the cut finger sprang into the air and over the cask and fell next to me. The dwarf had turned to look for it, and lifted a torch in the direction he thought it flew, but not seeing a gleam of gold from the ring, abandoned the search and turned his attention back to his task. 
So when their conversation waned, and the dwarf again took up the torch, I knew the reason, as he passed it over the ground and against the shadows on the wall that he was creating with his light. I covered my mouth with my hand, trying with all my might not to make a sound. In my other hand, I held the finger. I don't know why, but when the ring came off, I put it on my finger. The dwarf came near the casks. It may have flown behind these, he said. But before the man could get close enough to look, the old woman who was by the great pot cried, Come and get something to eat and leave off looking till the morning. That finger won't run away from you. And the dwarf gave up his search and sat down to eat the grisly stew. While the men were eating and drinking, the old woman poured their wine, and she added, I later discovered, a flask of the sleeping draft into their goblets that they had sometimes used on the stronger of the women they dragged into that place. The result, they soon laid down in the cellar, their snores echoing through the cavern. The moment I heard the sounds of their snoring, I peeked again through the gap in the casks and, confirming they were all sound asleep, came out slowly, stepping over them, for they lay in rows on the ground. The old woman sensed my drawing near and coaxed me over to her with her whispers. This way, dear one, careful for the fat one, he's harder to step over. This way, dear one, careful for the dwarf. He ends before he begins. This way, dear one. Careful for the tall one. You are betrothed, since his one eye is open. I froze. Were they only pretending to be asleep? From the fire, I saw what she could not have seen with physical eyes. How did she know? An eye unseeing was open. Yet he slept. I tread more carefully, fearful to disturb so much as a pebble on that hard ground. With each footfall, I trembled that they would reach out and grab me, pull me to them, and rip with their teeth my flesh from my bones. So I was, with God's help, quiet as a mouse. Once past the men, I was reminded of another concern to save the old woman who reached out as I brushed past and clamped her hand on a mine. Together, we made our way to the stairs leading up into the shack above with its many gray rooms. The stairs betrayed us, creaking beneath our weight on every step. Still, the men slept. They moved... They rolled, but they didn't awaken. Once at the landing that led into the house, hand in hand, the old woman and I made it from one room to the next until we reached the foyer. No sooner had I put my hand to the doorknob that would lead us out into the night than did the red-tufted bird screech. A murderous house, you are And the nut dropped in the cage and rolled out like thunder onto the wooden floor below. Sounds from the cellar echoed throughout their cave. The old woman, one of them shouted, into the night. And the cage door opened and out flew the bird. It seemed to be happening slowly, one event at a time. But the old lady's grip tightened all in that one instant, and I found myself pulled by her out the door and into the forest. With an agility and speed that surprised me, we flew down the lane in the direction I indicated, even though the wind had blown away the strewn ashes. It was the peas and lentils that guided us. For since my dropping them, they had sprouted and grown up. Their leaves were bright red, like the gray bird's frill, and easy to follow in the moonlight. The old lady and I ran for a long while, until we had put enough distance between us and the house to slow to a walk, and it took the balance of the night to make it to the mill. 
Lightning flared soundlessly in the east, and the air that was thick and hot in the night began to cool with the coming of dawn. By morning, we arrived at the mill, and I turned to look at the old woman whose hand had never left mine. She seemed frail from all the travel, and my first impression was right. Eyes sewn shut, yet beaming with happiness as though she were whole and healed. We made it, I said. And then I saw my father and ran to him, dropping the old woman's hand and falling upon his neck while unleashing the sobs that had been pent up inside me this whole time. I told him everything, exactly as it had happened. My father, cunning as he was strong and good, told me that since the wedding was next week, I should say nothing about what took place to anyone else but to go on with everything as planned. I'm not marrying that man, I blurted. I know, he said. I know. And he walked over to the old woman and took her hand and led her back into our house. The week passed quickly, but bore hard upon me with each successive day. My father, I knew, had a plan, but he did not share it with me. So, the following week, on the night before the wedding, my betrothed appeared, smiling from ear to ear, happy to see me, and asking why I never visited him like I promised. I merely smiled and did my best at avoiding his questions without making him suspicious. My father rented out a great big hall on the outskirts of town and invited all of our relations and friends. As we sat at the table, a large bay window giving us a view of the drive in the wedding coach, each of the party was asked to relate something important to them. My betrothed stood and gave a moving speech about marriage as the bedrock of society, while I sat still and said nothing. Then my betrothed looked at me and said, Come, my darling, do you have nothing to say? I looked at my father, who nodded knowingly at me. I stood to my feet and said, I will relate a dream. I was walking alone through a wood, and at last I came to a house, in which no living soul was, but on the wall there was a bird, a most beautiful bird in a cage, which cried, Turn back, turn back, young maiden dear, tis a murderer's house you enter here. And this it cried once more. My darling, I assured him. I only dreamt this. Then I went through all the rooms, and they were all empty. But there was something so horrible about them. At last, I went down into the cellar. And there sat a very, very old woman whose head shook. I asked her, Does my betrothed live in this house? She answered, My poor child. You have come into a murderer's den. Your bridegroom does live here, but he will cut you to pieces and kill you, and then he will cook you and eat you. My betrothed grew white and was about to stand up to interrupt me. My darling, I said, placing a reassuring hand on his shoulder. This was only a dream. Do let me finish. He sat down heavily upon his chair as I recounted the rest of my story, and I got to the part about the ring. And one of the men, I said, saw that there was still a ring on her little finger, and, as it was hard to draw off, he took an axe and cut it off, but the finger sprang up in the air and sprang behind the great hogshead and fell into my bosom. And here is the ring. I pulled off my glove and showed the ring to him and those gathered. And there is the finger. And with these words, I drew it from the palm of my glove and held it high in the air for all to see. The eater of man flesh, who had, during this story, become white as a ghost, leapt up and tried to escape. But the guests, 
who had already been prepared by my father, held him fast upon the earth while my father took up an iron stake. He walked through the crowd which encircled that monster, crouched upon his chest, and proceeded to push it, the stake, I mean, into his eye and through it. Father then took up a hammer and proceeded to hit the stake repeatedly until it was planted firmly in the earth. You may be wondering how my friends and relatives responded to all of this, but they had already been informed about what had happened and what my father planned to do. After that hideous man was dead, my father and his friends searched for several days for that dark, dismal, and solitary house, that den of murderers. But they were unable to find it, even with my assistance. It was as if it disappeared. Gone were the red flowers that had blossomed. Gone, too, of course, was all that dark ash that my betrothed had scattered. All of that took place ten years ago, and the eaters of manflesh have never been found, though every year a handful of young women continue to go missing, and we know not where they go.